to Hope You Guess My Name. Welcome to my comic book review for this week of June 2014. I am, of course, the greatest goblin that had ever lived, a.k.a. Blue Goblin, a.k.a. Gobby, and I am here to review a pile of comic books. I apologize for being a bit late on this one. I am having trouble with punctuality here lately. i got to find the time to read these books and find the time to do a review. But this weekend, this past weekend, was a really good one. Uh, spent a lot of good time with, with my girlfriend Jennifer. We, uh, we are now up to four years together. Plus, I had a birthday this past weekend. And I am now to the ripe young age of 31. Yippee. But I am here to review some books and show off what I got. First thing I want to show off is the things that Jennifer got me. Uh, for my birthday, she got me a couple of wrestling books. A uh, book based off of Sting. This is called Sting, The Moment of Truth. I can't wait to read this. Sting, growing up, Sting was always one of my personal favorite wrestlers, so I'm really looking forward to reading that. She also hooked me up with this. Foley is good. One of Mick Foley's autobiographies, and uh, this is back during the old World Wrestling Federation days. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to reading this. Now, for those of you who are probably going to want a review of these books, I uh, hope you've got a lot of patience, because it's going to take me a while to get through these books. But, I promise I will try to find time to review these books once I, once I get them read. Another thing she got me, let me take the camera right here, and show off that thing hanging over here. This right here. She got this for me for our anniversary, this uh, Injustice Joker action figure. I really like that. Alright, let me move this back over here. <laughs> Moving the camera around. And then her folks, Ken and Sarah, got me this for my birthday. The Spider-Man Vault. A museum in a book dedicated to old webhead spider-man oh yeah this is good stuff now that I got all that out of the way and thank you Jennifer I love you and thank you Ken and Sarah I love you guys thank you for the books and thank you for the figure now let's get to the comic books we're gonna start with DC then run through Marvel and end on independent we're gonna start DC off with Batman and Rachel Ghoul number 32 uh, Peter Tomasi Patrick Gleason okay this book surprised me this book really surprised me on how good it was I was thinking okay this hunt for Robin stuff has got to end sometime and we got to get into the Robin Rises storyline and Oh, God, this book was so good. Patrick Gleason's artwork in here was magnificently done. It had me instantly thinking of Batman the Animated Series with some of the way with the way some of the characters were drawn and the way the dialogue was presented. You know, Peter Tomasi did such a great job great job with the writing. When I'm reading the dialogue that I see in here, I can hear those voices from the animated series. When I'm reading Batman's dialogue, I can hear Kevin Conroy in my head as I am reading his dialogue. I can hear the voice actor for Rachel Ghoul in here. I mean, it's just everything I wanted in here. There was even a one-liner from Batman. You know, he's like, you're wanting to turn Damien into a monster. No offense, Frankenstein. No, I'm taken. You know, I just thought that was kind of funny. And <laughs> to see Batman, of all people, you know, Mr. Serious and Dark pulling off a one-liner. And then... And then... This is when it gets really real. Because remember, Rachel Ghoul is one of those villains. It's probably the villain 
that is both an enemy to Batman and Bruce Wayne. You know, most of the Batman Rose Gallery just hate Batman, but Rachel Ghoul makes it personal for both Batman and Bruce. And there's something in here that Batman says to Rachel Ghoul that just completely made my eyes bug. I'm like, whoa! It's like, yeah, I can already tell that there's probably going to be some fans out there bitching saying it's out of character, but you have to think about it this way. That, that moment in this book really showcases just how fucking personal this really is for Bruce between him and Rachel Ghoul. And Rachel Ghoul fully believes what he's saying. And you know, I'm like, wow, this was really good. And then we get to, they have it all out, an all out fight in here. This book had everything I could ask for in a Batman comic book. This truly surprised me by how good this was. I'm giving this book a four. It was that good. Damn near perfect, but still just fucking awesome read. I loved it. Alright, moving on to Batwoman number 32. Oh boy. Um, this particular issue focused more on the the drama of Kate Kane. You know, concerning uh, a former lover of hers. A former girlfriend of hers has shown back up in Gotham City. And it's so it's like instantly awkward the moment she shows up. And no, it is not Renee Montoya. It is another former girlfriend from her past. And when I, you can tell that things probably didn't end so well between them. You know, and even Bet has to politely excuse herself so they can have their alone time and everything. Meanwhile, Kate's dealing with what's going on between going on between her and Maggie. You know, things ain't looking so bright between her and Maggie either. You know, kind of awkward phone conversations. And Kate's, Kate's stress is getting to her to the point where she's actually seeing the doctor uh, without making, a, making an appointment. You know, seeing a, her psychiatrist without making an appointment and everything. Uh, but meanwhile, as Batwoman, she's, you know, continuing to chase down thugs. And she comes across uh, a certain individual who has uh, uh, vampiristic capabilities, so to speak. And uh, things don't end so well for there either. I mean, the, I mean, Kate is just really having a bad day. That is the overwhelming theme of this particular issue. Just Kate is just not having a good day. And, um... Didn't know what to think. I don't know what to think about the cliffhanger. The cliffhanger was like, eh, okay. Uh, this was a pretty good read. A, 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 a decent read. Pretty good. I, I liked it for what it was. And it's not the strongest issue of Batwoman out there in terms of, you know, what I've been used to with the character like this and with a series like this. But for what I got, I was pleasantly surprised. I was, uh, well, I wasn't surprised. I was I was satisfied with what I got. I give it a three and a half out of five. I thought it was good. Really well done. And just, poor Kate, she's having a really shitty day. <laughs> Alright, moving on to Green Lantern New Guardians number 32. What are the Scions? Uh, this focuses heavily on Star Sapphire, Carol Ferris, and the mo most of the Guardians of the Universe. One of the Guardians has been taken by this alien entity or something like that and is ugh, things ain't looking so well for him he, I mean, he's, he's like being pulled apart and almost like dissected you know and you know because he gets caught up after rescuing a ch uh, an alien child and everything and we get to see Carol's frustration with the guardians because they're putting more concern with their brother over what's going on with Kyle because Nobody knows it. They don't know if Kyle's alive after what happened between between him and um, um, uh, shit. Forgot the name. Uh, I'm not a really big hardcore Green Lantern fan, but I'm loving what they're doing with this stuff. But, uh, but and the darker self that he that Kyle accidentally created. But. 
you know they they go go they go chasing after trying to find out what's what's uh, where their guardian brother has been taken, and of course they they're thinking on on revenge and vengeance and stuff like that, and they're not thinking clearly. And of course they go right into a trap. Only I'm going to spoil the cliffhanger. Only to apparently maybe getting saved by Kyle Rayner at the very end. Uh, look, with the, the past couple issues of Green Lantern New Guardians, and then I read this, it's kind of a step down for me. I just like, I'm having trouble remembering some of the shit I read in here. I only read this yesterday as I'm filming this. I'm just, I'm kind of disappointed. I mean, this issue wasn't horrible. It wasn't bad, but then again, it could have been a little bit better than what I got. Uh, not much to say. It's just kind of predictable character development for the the guardians of the universe you know considering their predecessors and how bastard how much of how big of bastards they were starting to see similar characteristics to these new guardians and Kyle Rayner just literally popping in at the last page I'm like yeah this just didn't really do much for me uh, a really big step down for me in in terms of you know storyline progression and everything uh, but they tried. They tried what they could, and I, I commend them for that. I give this a. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to give this a 2.5 out of five. <sighs> All right, moving on to Harley Quinn number seven. Oh man, this was good. This was really good. I love Amanda Connor, and I love Jimmy Palmi uh, Palmiotti. Chad Harden's artwork is just really good. Oh my god, I gotta say, uh, first of all, um, Amanda, Jimmy, does one of y'all have a foot fetish? Because there was a lot of attention to Harley's feet in this issue. And if there's anything wrong with that, I've seen weirder shit. I've seen, you know, I've heard of people getting off on being beaten up and, you know, or beating down or people getting choked. So you know, that's not a big deal. I think they're going for laughs on it, basically. But... The thing that focused, the thing I got my attention more than anything was much more uh, in uh, impl implications that you know Harley and Ivy are indeed a couple. You know, it's like they just they don't flat out say it, but but the way the dialogue is presented in here, I'm like, you might as well go ahead and fucking say it that they're that they're lesbian lovers, or they were at one time and they've cooled down to just friends or something like that, but they still playfully and sexually flirt with each other, especially Harley. You know, it's like Harley's, you know, Ivy's trying to get into a computer, and it's like, what's the username and password? And Harley looks at Ivy, puts her head on Ivy's lap, and says, how about kiss me and now? And she's like, later. And I'm like, oh, wow. Then, of course, there was the action. The action in here was really good. And we find out who it was that put the hit out on Harley. And I dare not spoil it because it was so damn awesome and so damn funny. Just really good. This was a solid read for Harley. A solid read. I enjoyed it. This was, once again, just pure fucking fun. I loved it. It was great. Props to everybody who worked on this. This was a fantastic read. I enjoyed the hell out of it. I give it a four. We're ending DC off with Red Hood and the Outlaws, number 32. DC, I have one request. If I was granted one request, I would say, get Scott Lobdell the fuck off this book. This was crap. I'm at, I'm a, I'm at my wits end with this. I mean, y'all know the only reason why I'm still buying this is because of Starfire, because she's not showcased in any other title that I know of for DC. I mean, some of the dialogue in here was, uh, it was, it was okay. The artwork in here wasn't bad. Uh, the story, the storytelling, yeah, it is what it is. And, you know, Jason, Corey, and Roy fighting a bunch of terrorists, like, yeah, that, 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 that hasn't been done in comics yet. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And the, the, there were only two things that really got my attention. Just two minor plot points. Number one was who was revealed to be the new head of security for Shade. That was interesting. 
that got my attention and what happened at the end of the issue with Starfire. It's only two plot points in an entire issue that simply just got my attention. Didn't really wow me. So all in all, this came off at best, at best an average read, but some of the stuff just still drags it down like Arsenal. It's like Arsenal just comes off as a fucking tool and nothing more than a character designed to troll on comic book readers because he, his character in this series sometimes just looks out of place like he was plucked from the 90s and shoehorned into today I, it just uh, if it was just Jason and Corey and if it was Arsenal from a few from a couple of years ago then that'd be fine but it just seems like Arsenal is just so out of place especially with that fucking trucker hat that he never seems to lose during a fight and just some of the dialogue sometimes just comes off really eh, and Starfire's approach with the nuclear bomb it just kind of it just didn't really do that much for me I'd give it a two alright we're moving on to Marvel we're starting off with Daredevil number four Mark Wade. don't ever leave this book for the love of God do not ever leave this book this was fantastic this was really good I thought they were going one way with how the last issue ended and then they go in the opposite direction in the beginning of this issue. Okay, here I thought the Shroud was going to betray Matt and it turns out him and Matt are still working together but they're not on solid terms. You know, it's like they work together but they're not getting along and okay, I was, okay that's not exactly original but Mark Wade's writing knows how to make it work. And it was very fantastically done. And the artwork in here was really good. Helped sell the storytelling and helped sell the dialogue and sell the action that was presented in here. And I like that, you know, Matt is out and about and everybody knows he's Daredevil and he's constantly being chased by people saying, can we get your picture? Can we get your picture? Yeah, sure. <laughs> get your picture. Get your picture. It's like, I have your autograph. He's got, you know, he's got a fan. He's got fans that follow him now. And it's, you know, it just kind of looks weird to him. But there's something that the Shroud does. He, t uh, without Matt knowing, he takes Owsley, and I wanted to. I want to go into details to what Shroud and old our old owl friend. I would love to go into details of what they do, but I don't want to spoil anything. It was really good. There's something that Owsley does in here that I'm like, whoa. This could lead to some really chaotic shit in the future. And I just want to leave it right there. I mean, this was really good. A solid read. Just fantastic stuff. I mean, with Mark, it's Mark Wade. How can you go wrong? It is he's that good of a writer. It's just really, really well put together, very well told. The dialogue works with the action. It also works with the artwork. It's just everything just works. Not perfect. But like I always say, for what I got, just let I just look at it for what it is, and I determine, you know, this is entertaining. This is good stuff. St this is all the stuff I could ask for in a good comic book. Just really good. Give it a four. Moving on to Wolverine and the X Men number five. Uh, the cover's not exactly accurate, but this is the next part of the. Oh, Phoenix Corporation versus Wolverine and his team of X-Men. Ah, uh, wow. I, long story short, uh, Quentin Quire jumps back into the fray and he makes a, a startling announcement that somebody amongst the future predictors or whatever, somebody is lying their ass off. Because the way they've strung out this future list of events that they say is going to happen something just doesn't add up and I loved how Quentin Choir I loved how he put his little spread on it you know his way of telling the story on how something is supposed to happen it just doesn't make any sense with all the rest of the stuff that that the Phoenix Corporation is saying is going to happen and all in all is just really solid really well done the, you know, the main focus is on Quentin, 
but there are some other good moments in here, especially what hap with what happens to uh, Faithful John, as I believe he's called. Yeah. Yeah. There's some more bitching and bickering between Scott and Logan. I know it's the same old dick measuring contest that they've had for fucking decades now. I get it. You know, it, it's it, but sometimes stuff like that is still captivating stuff to read. But I was really interested on how this particular issue ends because Quentin's on a selective mission to go do something in the future and somebody goes to follow him and I'm not going to spoil who it was because I'm like, this could get really interesting. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm trying my best not to spoil too much when it comes to this. This was really good. Very well told. Uh, you know, it is what it is. I, I enjoyed it. It was a good read. I was expecting a little bit more from it, but I give it a three and a half. All right, moving on to Uncanny X Men number twenty-two. Brian Michael Bendis, Chris Bocciolo. Okay, things are finally starting to unfold with what's going on between this particular team of X Men and Shield. First thing I want to say is it's good to see that Dazzler is finally free from Mystique's captivity and Magneto and Magique bring her to Racer X's team of X-Men and their healer heals her up and things are finally starting to come, starting to flow out. Okay, S.H.I.E.L.D. has now found out that Mystique has been Dazzler this whole time. And we find out who's the culprit behind the hijacking of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s helicarrier and the sentinels that show up in this issue. We find out who it is. I damn well am not going to spoil it because it was like, woo. Because the reveal is kind of, kind of bittersweet. Kind of. Uh, you got to read this to, to see, what I'm, see where I'm going with that. But Scott and his team of X-Men, or should I say Dick Summers, they point out something to Maria Hill. They basically tell her, you were a bad commander of S.H.I.E.L.D. because all this shit that happened between us happened on your watch. It's basically your fucking fault, not ours. You didn't intend to, but you ended up shooting first. Which is kind of true, sort of, but, you know, Maria Hill knows that she could be in deep shit. She's got to find a way to pick herself back up from this, from this horrible ordeal between S.H.I.E.L.D. and the X-Men. It ends very well. It's, you know, good that everything's been unfolded. We knew uh, Dazzler's free and she's back, so things are going to get... So I'm hoping things will get progressively better. I'd like to know what their what their plans are for for Mystique later on down the line in the series. But all in all, this was actually really good. I enjoyed this. This was a solid read. Uh, probably the best X Men title this week for me. Really good. I give it a four. It was actually really good. Really, really good. We're ending Marvel with just X Men number fifteen. Oh, uh, yeah, this kind of was, it was all right, you know, the, the future coming to take Shogo back from the X-Men, and, and uh, we get to learn more about this guy and what he could be capable of, but I think he even states in here that he is just a human, but he's able to, you know, he, he, he learned stuff about the X-Men, he studied them. He learned more about them. He he did his homework and the stuff that he's able to do in here. The thing, he, the 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 shit he did to Psylocke. Wow, you've got to be heavily skilled to do what he did to Psylocke in here. And there's like a prediction made of what he might possibly do to Jubilee. You know he claims he's the future and he's taking Shogo back because he's Shogo's father and uh, Storm makes a declaration that I could see where some people might say it's a little bit out of character but then again 
think about how much stress and how much shit Storm's been through here lately. So you gotta you gotta take it from that perspective. This issue was actually pretty good. The Bromo Superior at the end, the second part of the story of the book, it was all right for what it was. Psylocke's training a bunch of rookies and in the danger room, and she makes a big announcement that she had a lover in the danger room program, and she killed him to save them in that in that danger room exercise. Eh, it was all right. But the main story with the future and everything was pretty good for what it was. Uh, artwork was hit or miss with me. There were parts where it worked and parts where it didn't work for me. But the writing flowed very well. The storytelling was good. The action here was really good. I was just heavily surprised by what happened to Psylocke in here. I mean, that's just wow. Uh, really good read. I give it a three and a half. All right, we're moving on to indies. We're going to Dynamite with... Red Sonia number 10, Gail Simone. Love you, girl. You got some you got some good skills when it comes to writing characters like this. But man, Sonia, just like Kate Kane this week. I mean, Sonia just isn't having a good day. Her next item on her list is the the bladesman or the swordsman. And she finds she finds him. He claims to be the greatest uh, swordsman in the land and she of course challenges him and she also flirts with him because she's dirty she's tired and she's horny I just love how everything's mapped out in here she makes her play at this guy and what he says to her just fucking made me roll in laughter it was so good and I especially loved her her retort to that Oh my god, are you fucking serious? That was so cool. I fucking loved it. But what's really surprising is that she challenges him to combat and he humiliates her. He beats her easily and there's a reason why he's called the untouched. Nobody that's any n nobody that's nobody who's ever faced him has been able to even touch him in battle. And he makes a complete ass out of Sonya. To the point where she says this is the first time I've considered shedding tears since I've lost since I lost my family. Wow! But I loved how Sonya was able to think back on how on what kind of a warrior she is, and she challenges him again. And how she wins the this fight was really well told, really well done. I dare not spoil it. This was good. And he of course surrenders himself to her. And all she can think about is when is she going to be able to take a nap. I mean, this was really good. This is this is Gail Simone writing stuff that is just simply fun, enjoyable stuff. I loved it. This was great. You can say I overrate Gail Simone all you want. I don't care. I'm a fanboy. I'm proud of it. She's a great writer. She's a sweet person, a great friend to talk to. Yes, she talks to me personally on so through social media, through personal messages. She's even plugged my show about four fucking times. So let me be a fanboy. Let me appreciate her writing. Let me appreciate her storytelling and her love of these characters that she does write. This was good. I'm probably overrating it. But like I said, I'm a fanboy. Let me be a fanboy. And let me just enjoy this for what it was. It was fun. I give it a four. Now, we're ending this review with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number 35, from IDW. Oh, man. Um, this is a proper representation of what's going on in here. Raf and Mikey are, they catch up with their old friends, Old Hob, and with Slash. And something, they, you know, Hob wants... You know, Hob kidnapped a former Stockton uh, employee for the purpose of helping creating a mutant army. Because Old Hob is kind of coming off a little Magneto-ish, doing what he's doing for the sake of mutant kind. And it's kind of how it came off. But I loved how Kevin Eastman writes this. You know, Hobbs like, I want an army, I want it done now. And, you know, it was like, we tried we tried uh, creating a mutants ourselves, but we need professionals to help us out. So, 
they realize they tried themselves and they fucked up so they need professional help to help them do it right now that is admirable character development and Raph and Mikey try to you know see things from both sides of the fence and they come across something that old Ha has in his possession that he believes will help Slash uh, Slash's intellect you know because Slash has the mental capacity I hate to you know say this but Slash is kind of like a like a little child you know dialogue wise you know like Mikey friend Slash friend you know stuff like that and Hob has something in his possession I won't spoil what it is but him and the the scientists for Stockgen they realize that this may help Slash and they test it out and of course Slash goes berserk at first but once they snap him out of it it damn it it works it worked so Slash is now just as intelligent as as the rest of the turtles and the mutants and he can actually have a now an intelligent conversation but then we get to the cliffhanger of this book oh my god oh my god please no oh my god <sighs> Oh, God, you sure as hell got me interested in the rest of this storyline, Mr. Eastman. But that cliffhanger... Holy fucking shit. Do yourselves a favor. Pick up this issue. Get on board with this series. Look for the back issues that go into, that lead up to this issue read it and enjoy it but get to the end of this issue I got there and I looked at that last page my eyes bugged and my jaw dropped whoa oh my god I give this a four and a half out of five that cliffhanger. Jesus Christ, that cliffhanger. Oh, man. <laughs> well played, Mr. Eastman. Well played. You got my attention. Now, more than ever. Wow. Well, that's all I got for this week, everybody. Hope y'all enjoyed me shooting my mouth off about comics. Hope y'all enjoyed me showing off my stuff that I got for my birthday and for my anniversary uh, once again Jennifer love you baby uh, and thank you for four great years and many more years to come uh, please give your love and support to my bro the Mount Vernon kid and to Deadpool Zilla and Brandon Hex um, more reviews will be coming soon for my Blue Goblin X channel, so stay tuned for that and go subscribe to that channel. Thanks for watching, everybody, and until next time, I'll see y'all later.